as well. Brilliant. Okay, excellent. So thank you all, and uh, thank you um, to Helen and the team to uh, inviting us uh, and, and setting up this event. Um, really good to be back uh, for uh, the CIMR webinar. Um, always enjoy these debates, and I think we've got a particularly um, particularly good one today, um, and also an interesting theme. Um, we've got two great speakers who um, I think are really the top of the list of most people who would organise an event on um, uh, innovation, creativity or entrepreneurship in the Liverpool city region. Um, so having both talking is, uh, is, is great. And so we, uh, we want to preserve some time for the Q&A and panel at the end. So I will, I'll be uh, fairly brief in my comments. Um, first of all, we, we have uh, Alison Poutney, who is innovation coach at the University of Liverpool and delivers the core entrepreneurship programme there. Um, and she's also a well-known singer and, and music entrepreneur, um, and along with her husband Mark, uh, is uh, is well known in the music scene. Uh, so you can actually check her out on the on the Spotify. I think it's the case, uh, uh, Alison. So, um, so and and uh, like uh, the second speaker, uh, Dr. Dave Tully, who is a founder of uh, SceneGraph and is a, a leading in, innovator in uh, VR and metaverse technologies. Um, so a very different view, perhaps, of the creative industries, but there clearly are overlaps. It'd be interesting to explore that. Um, Dave is noted for his work in, in the mental health applications of um, VR and metaverse technologies. Um, and he's also a teacher at the Liverpool John Moores University. He's taught for many years there. Um, so um, like Alison, he's ideally placed in terms of both the formal institutional setting of creativity and entrepreneurship and skills development, but also um, the, the informal, more entrepreneurial side of that industry. So uh, it's great to have them both. So thank you. Um, the um, I'll, I'll set out sort of just a few uh, points to, to just sort of you know, tee up the debate. Um, so first of all, we'll, um, we'll try and focus on a few key questions. And this is obviously a lot to talk about. Um, so, you know, why, why Liverpool particularly? We've um, focus this on the Liverpool context. Um, I think that will become clear soon. Um, what is creative entrepreneurship and why is it particularly important? And we want to focus on this, you know, perhaps the role of the universities um, and whether they play, what role they should play. So I think both, as I said, both Alison and David uh, can help with that. So I'll move on quite quickly. Um, so um, this is really, a, a, a you know, there's some talk about another Beatles Museum in Liverpool. Um, so, you know, not another one was the response from many people. Um, there is a, a, obviously a, a debate about obviously the uh, legacy of uh, a certain well-known band and its role in Liverpool. And of course it helps Liverpool have a, a global brand. On the other hand, it looms very large. And there is a discussion about heritage and creativity and how they sit together. So um, we, we're not just talking about another Beatles museum, I think is a key point. Um, uh, creative entrepreneurship uh, has become a significant um, policy item um, across um, you know, both at the UN, uh, where it's seen as actually integral to um, development and, and human development, uh, but also in the UK economy uh, because of its size and significance. And perhaps over the last few years, um, we've started to uh, map and, and actually see the size and significance of the creative entrepreneurial industry, which was not clear beforehand. Um, so I'll, I'll show you some of the outcomes of that. Now, I think, I think some of the research is still problematic, um, and, but that we are starting to get some useful um, guidance as to what we mean by creativity, uh, what is the creative industry, um, and where does it exist? So I'll refer to some of these things. And of course, uh, Aura um, and the team will be putting these out in, in blogs so you, you can see some of these links afterwards. Um, so I just flashed over this. It was very significant. Um, one in eight jobs uh, in the UK are linked to the creative industry. It's, it grows five times as much as other sectors. Um, you can see some of the numbers here. So we are when you start putting it all together, so the creative industry includes everything from the, the sort of classic visual arts um, uh, and to quite experimental projects in, say, the performing arts, 
all the way through publishing and of course involves technologies such as you know the the, the, the virtual reality augmented reality which which Dave will explain in more detail um, so it has a has a technology element to it as well so it's um, it's it, it's much larger than it seems many of these businesses are micro businesses uh, and locally owned businesses which makes also the, it makes a very interesting topic so uh, why Liverpool? Liverpool um, has been underperforming as an economy for many years, although it's been massively restored and, and regenerated uh, in, in over the years. Um, it's still seen as being somewhat problematic uh, relative to other um, cities of a similar size, such as Bristol or Hull or others. Um, the, uh, that there are also some governance issues, such as you know, the mayor has been arrested for a significant um, corruption uh, investigation, uh, and the government has in installed a commission um, to uh, investigate the governance of the city council. Now, um, this has an impact, not least because in, in the commission report, they highlighted the governance and funding, particularly of art institutions, the Epstein Theatre in one case, and the Arena Centre in another. Um, so, and it is, I think, the case that, that creative businesses do generate their own problems when it comes to governance and spending and so on. So, so that there's a there's a kind of wider uncertainty here. So researchers and academics who, you know, this is an interesting topic. The other thing, interesting thing about um, the, uh, the whole research that's going on here is Liverpool does not feature very highly in terms of creative clusters. Um, so when you look at the detail of the Nesta report, um, it's, uh, for example, which looks in, in some detail, it's, you start to see actually the creative clusters largely fall outside Liverpool and very much gravitate towards Manchester uh, and the Chester corridor. Um, now, this is not, I think, the experience of most people who live in Liverpool and who visit Liverpool who do see the city as a very creative uh, hub. So I think it's an interesting question is why it's not been picked up in the data. I think some of this is to do with the location quotient and the fact that the the size of the local size of the creative economy in the local economy and size of the local economy to the overall national economy is underweight in Liverpool, um, and also it's tending to um, increase the significance of some of the technology and the more revenue generating aspects of the creative industries. So, for example, uh, you have. Um, so Crawley is a town which I grew up in, for example, I don't think anybody would say, so th this is the top 20 micro clusters of, of, of creative industries. Um, Crawley is there, uh, my hometown, and Liverpool isn't on this list, which I think most people would find very surprising. Uh, but I think that's to do with the prevalence of the software industry in Crawley in the London Brighton corridor. Um, but something is missing in relation to Liverpool. Why is Liverpool not there? So I'll pose that question to Alison and Dave as we talk through the panel. Um, we don't score highly on you know, things like survival rates, uh, for example, um, uh, and, and survival rates. What, where, what is happening is I think there are some exciting developments, such as the, the Future Yard, Start Yard, um, Rock points in, in New Brighton and the Baltic Creative, which we should pick up on. So, what I'll do is I'll just sort of pose these questions and, and hand over to Alison, who can pick up the main debates from here. And we'll come back to these questions at the end. Um, so, the, the role of the universities in this creative skills development, what skills should we be developing in this very uneven, uncertain world? Uh, do we go for a vertical city built around grade A office space? Um, a much more commercial city or a more horizontal creative city um, and you know how do we get Liverpool to be in say the top 10 creative hubs in the UK uh, from where we are now so so what I'll do I'll pause there um, hopefully that's good to give them food for thought I'll hand over to Alison who's uh, well placed to give us some views on that and um, great to have you Alison thanks very much for joining us no problem at all so i'll pick up the discussion about that at the end i'm just going to do a quick presentation about lcr founders which is you know when you think of a university and entrepreneurship you think of oh, a management school or um i'm just going to stop sharing this because i need to share the audio as well um you think of a management school or academia in general research and everything and the aim of 
projects such as LCR Founders is to cover those missing areas. You know, the, it's run by professional services, industry experts within real life settings. So real business owners, you know, getting our entrepreneurs and residents and different things like that, which is so important because we don't want to get lost in the in the world of research. You know, REF is a huge area of interest where we get marked on, but also CAF is. And I think that CAF for, you, for, for Liverpool in general has been neglected. And this is a perfect opportunity to start addressing some of these issues. So yeah, this is an independent project um, in partnership between University of Liverpool and John Moores called LCR Founders. So we look at enterprise at the heart of a city region and look at a collaborative approach to creating an ecosystem that supports student startups. It is an EDRF funded project at the moment, but we're looking at a legacy to continue it going on. So I've just told you what it is. I'm just going to show you a quick video just to, to summarize the, the feeling of being on the project. Hi, my name is Sue and I'm the project manager for the LCR Founders Project, which is a collaborative project between University of Liverpool and Liverpool John Moores. The project is to bring students together in a co-founders approach to business startup. Today we've got our second social event of the year and the aims of the socialists to bring the both universities together so students can meet and talk about their business ideas, their experiences and hopefully find their co-founder. I have a business called the Amama and we collaborate with refugees and they handmade our products and we sell them online. I am founding a business called Literary Style and luckily I have the support of LCR founders to help me with that process. So well, the aim of the project is to keep student graduate talent within the city region. So the ideal scenario is that a student from John Moores will match up with a student from the University of Liverpool and really gel, hit it off, have complementary skill sets, which will enable them to start up a business in the city region and stay and grow. I love the LCR Founders Project. I've worked with the university for the past 18 months setting up uh, our online platform to support the, uh, the LCR Founders Project. I work generally in mentorship, supporting young people and businesses within the city. I was invited to come down and talk about the platform that we developed and maybe talk to some of the founders and, and just to take any questions and just to support the LCR Founders Project. So I think it's really important for the city to support itself. I need to network and get to know other people uh, that are with LCR Founders like to work with some people. I'm doing a lot on my own. I'd just like to meet some other people that I may be able to join forces with. Today I'm here because I want to network with other businesses. I want to get to know uh, like-minded people, get inspired, connect, and explore other opportunities. It's been amazing, yeah. Uh, I've been learning lots of lessons that, like, the power of networking is amazing. I would highly recommend LCR Founders. A lot of people, I think, have business ideas, but they don't have a support network, they don't have the finances, they don't know how to develop the idea, and that's what they're here for to help you with. So the Founders Socials will hopefully be a monthly thing in the afternoons. Come and grab a coffee and have a chat with one of our coaches. If you are a student or a recent graduate from either of those universities and you're interested in enterprise, finding out more about co-founding as it starts of option then follow us on our social media find us on the website and drop us an email that just helps us look at how we're addressing business support and co-founding and those startups in a different way it's not just your usual business program where you get a coffee in a clinical setting um, so yeah makes it a bit more unique and social it's a bit of a social experiment really so LCR founders will engage with over 3,000 students and graduates before June 2023. 
We provide 12 hours of enterprise and skills development and innovation coaching to over 400 students and grads. We're going to support at least 40 co-founder businesses to start up and provide a range of funding opportunities to each business. So a founder's journey looks something like this. A student will join our community. They'll gain access to training and support. They'll network, which is the, the most important key element of this is the getting within the city region. So we highlighted again, they're going to find their team and build the networks even further. They'll gain access to bespoke coaching, legal support, become ready for pitch and investment. We'll register the business with them, award them some grants, celebrate the successes. Then they will gain a fellowship and come back into the community to share the knowledge again. This is highlighting some of those areas of the the horizontal city rather than vertical city, which we'll pick up on later. So we're building our community by using accessible language, things like how to start a business with your mates. Um, we've got a green room, a Teams channel with over 470 students and grads with an additional Discord chat created. We've got a Get To It platform, which is a project website that allows for matching skill sets and mentoring. There's also marketplaces and discussion boards on there for the students. We're creating authentic challenges and programmes. We're working on real world projects to help them develop their entrepreneurial skills ready. Um, we've got development workshops, which include guest speakers from across the city region, um, as well as that one to one innovation coaching. And as a project, we aim to do none of the activity or workshops on campus. We want everything to be external. We want to be supporting our ecosystem as well as taken from it. So we're doing that across venues across the city region. We're looking at providing a sense of belonging and inclusion. We want to retain the graduate talent in the city. So we're building a community of like-minded students and grads. Our ecosystem of support from within the city allows the students to feel like they not only belong to the university, but also to the city. The students have started to make friendships that are continuing way beyond the project already. And they've already started co-founding their startups in an authentic way I must add as well. So it's important that we understand our role as a feeder and not a leader um, and that's within this ecosystem because many organisations, universities, government initiatives, they change the offer, they change the people, the staffing, the outputs, the funding. So it's, it's our role really to ensure that entrepreneurs are the leaders for the ecosystem that's to make sure that there's a long-term investment there with their passion for the location, the support for other entrepreneurs and also the subjects. So the information needs to be shared horizontally and not vertically. So we're trialing this Boulder thesis, which is found in the Startup Communities book by Brad Field. And so far, we've been delivering support such as a Design Your Future 10 week programme, which takes a student from idea to final pitch, and it's delivered by industry experts. So not academics, we're bringing people in from within the city who are experts in the area to deliver these programmes. We're also looking at, you know, looking at creativity in a different way. So you might take a student who does finance, but then we're building how they're going to enhance their creative and their communication skills with extra subject areas such as documentary making on an iPhone and podcasting and presenting, which will help them with marketing and all different aspects of the business. We've also got a big focus on sustainable business challenges. So currently we're just about to team up with Peel Ports to put on a sustainable business challenge there, and that'll include creativity as part of that. We're making accessible introductions, as mentioned before, so how to start a business with your mates, how to talk with angels and idea jams. We're using technology such as um, some venture validate software to do drop in sessions and validate the students business ideas and providing a bunch of finance and law clinics. So the message, I'm not going to go into this in too much detail, but some of the words that sort of represent what our message is as a project and that's collaboration, partnership, integration, network, the co-founding culture, entrepreneurial, ecosystem, growth and all that kind of thing. So we created that brand with the students, you know, again, thinking about the entrepreneur being the leader and we're just the feeder, we're there to facilitate things to happen. So the students created the brand with us. I think you can see Andrew there in the background too. So our brand is everybody needs a wing person. We are creators, curious, dreamers, innovators, optimists and progressives. We are LCR founders.
And that's just a little bit of the brand in action there with two of our co-founders, Olivia and Marino. So a little bit of a case study will be, Rudy came to me on a business development program on his own with a food tech company called Abjack. But on Founders, he met Mo, who was the founder of Ariosoft, a gaming company. And then they realized that they had different skill sets. You know, they blended their personality types, matched, you know, like were complementary to one another. So I introduced them to Dan Davies, who is over in New Brighton. And he currently runs the Rock Point Leisure Group. And he has given them co-founding space, office space. They're about to set up a ghost kitchen together there. And that's us all holding an award that we won for the best talk in startup growth and scale up at the International Entrepreneurship Conference just gone by. So it's really exciting time. And this is crossing the water as well. This is going from Liverpool to New Brighton, which is equivalent to New York and Brooklyn. You know, you're crossing that river and making connections with the you know, the more independent side of things. So supporting our ecosystem, we've got tons. This is just a, a snapshot really of people who we're working with. So we're trying to integrate, keep that ecosystem alive, give back and take as much as possible um, and just really create that strong sense of Liverpool city region being this new cluster for startup support as well as supporting mini clusters within that. So the successes to date is we've had 5,000 people engaged since January this year. We've already registered over 20 business startups, provided £10,000 worth of Bathgate funding already. Um, we've got a growing identity now through our social media presence. Um, we're doing loads of collaborative projects within the city region, putting on co-founding events. We've got our monthly entrepreneur meetups across the city, which is not just the both universities, that's open to all founders within the Liverpool city region, regardless of where they're from. We've got nominations for Young Persons of the Year and Business Awards at the Liverpool Chamber of Commerce. And we've already won the best talk in startup growth scale up at the International Ed Enterprise Educators Conference this year. So next, we've got- Sorry, a sorry just, just a minute, just one minute uh, warning on this one. So we're just gonna wrap up in a minute if you can. Yeah, I think this is my last slide. Thanks, thanks a <laughs> So what we're planning next is an innovation challenge with Peel Ports. We've got tech hackathons with another startup grind entrepreneur. And we've got additional co-founding workshops. We're looking at more software to work with to get our students working with tech. We've got increased amounts of expert-led workshops. We're looking at possibly embedding founders into curriculum subjects as well, holding some festivals and growing our platform for Get To It. So we just hope that there's a legacy left behind, you know, that is wider than University of Liverpool and John Moores. We want to have established links within the city region, put placement and internships within businesses and embed these programmes into subject areas and curriculum. So thank you for listening. I've been Alison Poutney, an innovation coach, and I look forward to hearing Dave's talk and then discussing our pros and cons in our panel discussion. Thank you very That's, much. Yeah, thanks, Alison. That's brilliant. Thank you. Great to see that project doing so well. So, and uh, and the thing to take away from that is, is the impact on the ecosystem, which I think is a big difference from classical uh, university programs. So, come back to that, Dave. We'll go straight in. I may have to be um, unreasonably hard on you, Dave. Uh, so, in terms of timing, so we finish at say twenty-two. So, I'll leave it to you to manage. That's fine with me, dude. Yeah, good. Is it? Yeah, I'll just share this. Screen. Thanks a lot, then, Dave. <clears throat> Uh, can everyone see uh, yeah, these slides? Yes. Cool. Rocking. Right. I'm going to blast through these because, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know whether I got the wrong end of the stick. Uh, but, yeah, I just kind of made some slides covered like what we do as a company. Uh, but I kind of want to get on some of the points that everyone's been making about Liverpool, how to actually make this industry better. Uh, one, for me as a company, because I'm selfish and I want to grow us up into the biggest VR company, biggest immersive company in the Northwest, if not the UK. Uh, some blue sky thinking. Uh, but also just some of like, the struggles that we've had uh, just going along the way from previous 
obviously academia, uh, etc. So yeah, just to introduce ourselves, uh, we are SceneGraph Studios and in short uh, we build epic, no interactive real time simulations from virtual reality, augmented reality, through the actual using Unreal Engine, game engine technologies, basically just to make cool shit. So that's what we like to do. Uh, my name's David Tully, Dr. David Tully, uh, going from it all. Uh, yeah, let's see where we're going. Uh, going to skip that with some clients, uh, but in short, yeah, clients like to do 3D stuff because marketing, 3D comes into everything that kind of we do, everything of the future. Um, so if you're into like 3D technologies, immersive technologies, yeah, you're going to have a bright future. Might be a little bit slow to begin with, but just do good work and you're going to be sorted. Uh, I was going to be covering like what Scene Graph does, how I got here, what you should be doing. So I think just on the panel or people viewing is this like mainly masters people who are trying to get into the industry or like is there anyone in the chat who's for that can we get off this chat so yeah if there is and if anyone says into, into the chat just yeah jump on by because uh, i kind of want to talk about what people want to learn and stuff uh and then yeah it's like what you should be doing if you want to get into the immersive space so come back to that one so some of the services that we do uh yeah virtual reality augmented reality games lots of scanning so we don't really do too much scanning now because technology has moved on we've got iphones so people can just make their own businesses by getting an iphone make some 3d models uh, by just scanning them and then uploading them online and making a shed ton of money by doing nothing so if you're not making money in one year's sleep then you're always going to be poor. That's what Warren Buffett said. Uh, and it is true because you've got the technologies and the platforms there just to make little side hustles, monies. Lots of stuff that we do with CGI. It's all using Unreal Engine, Blender. These are free technologies uh, that we want to do. Uh, and then, yeah, 3D web and web design. We're kind of moving away from that because, yeah, web design is mainly, if you don't do it full time all the way, it's just not worth it. And that's what we've found. Specialise in what you're good at and specialise what you're passionate uh, at because there's 7 billion people, in fact, 8 billion people. I'm pretty sure some of them are going to buy your niche uh, criteria from it all. And then the future of technology is what, what I think is remote desktop. So if you want to get into like the immersive arts, the creative, you don't want to buy, I don't know if it comes up on my screen, any cameras or whichever, uh, you don't want to buy a four grand PC just to try out some of this new technologies, which I think the cloud is the future of all this, i.e. remote in, use uh, someone else's computer and then just render it there for a couple of quid a day instead of four grand setups. Cool. Uh, some of the virtual reality work we've done. So with uh, John Moores and Birmingham City Uni, we made some near simulations where you can kind of give bad news to some patients uh, trying to actually help people. Uh, in this bottom section, we made virtual reality interviews that's being used in DWP. Uh, that just allows people yeah, to have interviews but being orchestrated by users from outside of virtual reality, kind of making these technologies. Again, I'm going to blast through these. Um, if you're interested in augmented reality, that I would say it's a good platform for you. Don't worry about any of the apps. What you should be getting into is Snapchat and Spark AR. That tech is free, to upload it is free, and then you can just start building up your criteria. If you know how to do any 3D programming, you can get on in on, in on there. And again, it's all free. And to go back on today, this little guy, like, yeah, never knew Snapchat, never knew Spark AR before trying these. This dude took us about 10 minutes to do. Get a 3D model from online, throw them on a Z. There we go. We got some promo for International Toilet Day, and it makes it look cool. Uh, Got to skip this because yeah, we do some games development, but all of our technology is using games technology. My previous background is teaching games technology at Liverpool John Moores. I quit to actually go into the industry because I hated the politics, hated the admin, hated the direction where education was going, uh, and this is why you know I'm here talking to you guys because I've got my plans for education. I've got my plans to actually build up this company uh, a little bit more, and it doesn't really involve unis because I think the unis in Liverpool and a lot of them around education in the UK is just letting people down. So cool. We do a lot of 3D scanning. So MetaHuman stuff uh, with uh, Unreal Engine. So I hope you can see that looks slightly like me. And again, this took about 10 minutes to set up. So the tech is out there. You just got to invest a little bit of time going in there. But I think with the tech moving so fast, you need groups together. So like the founders, yeah, awesome. I met Rudy, uh, not through the founders, uh, but yeah, Rudy from there, great guy. I'm just collaborating more. And I think that's a key thing that Liverpool gets wrong. Same with the, the Wivel and Merseyside is no one knows what each other's doing. So that's the one point that I want to put onto the debate is no one talks, which is a shame, but this is why we're trying to build up collectors. And yeah, Jonathan Clark, with his uh, startup grind, 
they're doing some cool stuff and it's just about getting involved. Uh, cool. Going to skip that. Technologies to learn for this stuff. So if anyone's interested in this type of things, uh, Unreal Engine is the future. Unity. I wouldn't worry about that uh, too much because yeah, the kind of CEOs go more like just sell into everyone. People don't like that. If you're into any type of 3D stuff, Blender is where it's at. It's all free. It can do some amazing VFX work. Uh, yeah, all the Adobe software. If you just learn one of these really well, you will be a good freelancer and you'll be able to work with SMEs because again, I don't want to learn any of these technologies anymore. I want to learn Unreal and I want to do it very good. If you try and learn everything, you're going to just not master anything and you're not going to get any money from it all. Cool. So industries to go to. And again, I'm blasting through this because I want to do some comments about the education system. If you want to go into film, you want to learn Cinema 4D, Premiere Pro, Blender, DaVinci Resolve and After Effects. So Blender, DaVinci Resolve, free. VFX, Unreal Engine, Blender, both free. After Effects, you're going to pay for, but student uh, prices about 15 quid a month, not too bad. And then a lot of the others um, are just all entail. Unreal Engine, Blender, Unreal Engine, Blender, mobile games. I would just go with Unity because that's what they're made for. Uh, and then, yeah, jump up from that. I'm uh, going to skip this because I can just share all the slides and basically a lot of the other comments that I kind of wanted to do if people are getting into this industry, especially if you're just going to be one man bands or small one man bands or like two, three SMEs, you're going to have to wear a lot of hats. But wearing a lot of hats is confusing. Uh, I've made a lot of mistakes, <laughs> so a hell of a lot of mistakes that have cost me a lot of time, cost me a lot of money by trusting even the wrong accountants setting up the company up wrong uh, but i think one thing that i will say to everyone is to just try it set up your company wrong it's like it doesn't really matter too much if you're an L, um, a limited company or a sole trader it costs like 15 pounds to set up you can always change it in the future you can always close and like if you're making money and you're good at your job you can always pay those fines and when i talk about fines we didn't get into trouble from those ways just our accountants set some things up wrong so yeah we did get a fine from that way because we trusted the one person so yeah make sure that you actually speak to people trust on advice but even then some things can happen uh, and yeah from a policy thing uh, point of view yeah i think it's just you need to kind of just have the I want to say the balls because it's not very PC, but you just need to have the, the the freedom to fail. In this country, I think a lot of people are scared to fail. And in America, if you have a failed business, you pull up in high regard. In the UK, it's like, ah, oh, they've failed. They don't really know what they're on about, uh, which is completely not the right case. You should be failing. You should be learning fast. And I think just locally in Liverpool, so I, don't, I know a couple of people from the chat are from London, uh, most we put like some policies together, but I think having the council involved in a rapidly moving enterprise like immersive technologies, virtual reality, augmented reality, uh, games development is just the wrong choice to go. They need to facilitate the companies to actually do the good work because uh, this is, I think, the problem and this is part of the problem why I quit uni. Uh, so I need to be a senior lecturer teaching games technology, virtual reality, augmented reality at Liverpool John Walls, still visiting there. But I quit because one, the industry is moving too fast. So we had to update our tutorials. Uh, so let's say if I'm teaching physics and AI, which I did. Yep, physics hasn't changed since Newton, but the technology to do physics in games has. So every six months I need to update my stuff. Um, I think the higher ups in universities weren't smart enough to notice, put some more money into games technology. Uh, and then I think that's just spilling out into the industry now. So the whole industry and the whole education is just not moving fast enough for this technology. So this is why we're building our own collective called Dark Side Collective on the Wivel, uh, is to basically put on little training sessions uh, for people to go fast. This is why we're investing in cloud infrastructure. So people don't have to invest loads of time into spending four grand on a PC to try it. No, let's go forward. Let's go forward fast because the problem with education is I'm trying to hire people and I cannot hire people because one, they're not developed for work because they just go on Facebook, scroll all day and it's like, great, it would be nice if it was reviewing Facebook, but no. Uh, and then just the idea of just learning what it is. If it isn't on YouTube and someone isn't showing them, I think a lot of students just can't think. But then also the other side of the problem is some big companies 
Sony's come back to town, Tencent's come back to town. These are huge companies, so they get, they get the cream of the crop. Liverpool's an SME centre, two, three, four man teams in the digital sector. It's most probably just going to be less and we freelance out. We freelance to Manchester, we freelance well to London, to abroad. It's like, man, that money's going away. We need to keep that money coming in. We need to be the home technology, not kind of, not a a city, an LCR, where it's kind of just constantly giving out handouts if we need to kind of just say, right, we're an immersive uh, city, we're a creative city, let's go full tilt into it. How do we actually incubate these small people like us um, to actually do good work? So I think LCR founders, great start, but I think it's a dissemination of digital understanding and that, that's where a lot of the problems come with our technology. So a lot of our clients are from London, from Amsterdam, um, where was it, like, yeah, Milan, because they understand the technology, where I think locally it's not. So it's, who should that be up to? Should that be up to us to teach the council, to teach education providers like universities, or do we just go alone? So I think that's kind of something to throw out to the group. And I think once we yeah chatted with Andrew saying, oh, it's turning into a little debate, not just the kind of, here's what seeing graph does, sad. Let's debate this. Let's see where it actually goes and how we can fix it. One, to maybe stop these managers of universities in 150 grand or 120 grand, but then not having a say of where those students go because I think a lot of universities don't care where the students go afterwards because they've already got the 50 grand from the students. But I don't want the students, or like let's say some of my staff haven't been 50 grand's worth of debt. Uh, just, uh, just in check, just one more minute, Dave, yep. just to wrap up. Sad. Yeah, so then not getting into, uh, yeah, 50 grand's worth of debt and then not getting the job because it's not working. It's not the city needs to kind of come in and just go, right, from college all the way to a job. That's it. Cool. I'll uh, shut up and I'll stop moaning. Apart from that, loads of other good things happening on the Wibble. Start yard, good. Future yard, amazing. We're pushing it all. And I think, yeah, we just need to keep going all together and chat more. That's the main point. Cool. Andy, done. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Thanks very much for for, um, for some pretty forthright comments there. Uh, just before we, we just open it up, I'd love to give uh, you, Alison a, a chance to respond to some of that. Um, if you've got any instant response or questions, to what David just said, and what just want to kick that around a bit? Yeah, so I think that you've got to remember what both of us were not students anymore. Times have changed a little bit. Um, the academia side, the departmental faculty side may be behind the times. You know, they, they need to readdress what you're paying for. However, those extracurricular things that are available, you know, the career services in, in most universities now are that they're the departments that are able to to act quick, stay relevant, and um, get with like for me, you know, where you're saying like technology goes behind the time. So rather than me buy technology in, I'll bring experts in. I'll work with anybody in the city region collaboratively, give the students what they want, regardless of if it's creative tech, creative arts, or or any area. Um, just get them immersed. You're saying nobody talks like the the main success so far I would say in the past two years of since I've worked in the careers departments doing enterprise for the University of Liverpool students is to shout about the students to bring those industry experts in to start creating those connections and creating that ecosystem you know so every person who's got a connection if they they meet another company or industry expert in the city region that they've got their own network that they can expose them to. So it's just creating that whole map of different connections that they can get to put them right. Um, and I think it is unfair to say that a university does just take the money off the students because they do get marked on how many students go into specialist skills jobs. So a university rating, it goes down. And um, so I know from a University of Liverpool perspective, like that weren't the best this year. Um, whether they blame COVID or anything like that, who knows? But from a careers department, we know that that's the most important thing is to get those students into jobs, get them value for money and provide as much extracurricular stuff as we can. Um, I've seen a comment in the chat as well to talk about how we would embed LCR founders into curriculum, which would be really difficult, not going to lie, because getting that academic buy-in is difficult. and 
we would only ever be able to get that in with the buy-in because time and credentials and all this is a bit of a headache. However, we can do it extracurricular, prove, you know, give it a bit of a legacy, prove that it works and then get the buy-in, get some of those academics to start thinking entrepreneurial, get them to start taking risks and going outside the subject area a bit more. Um, and look at commercialization I, more as well yeah can i jump in there like, uh, yeah, like yeah. when i say like universities i wasn't meaning like your funds i think like uni temps the career hub yeah perfect doing all that stuff amazing like yeah it is kind of quite uh, departments that i have issues with but it also stems up from high ups of just going ah cool sweet so i was speaking to a lecturer yesterday just saying like there's one in his class who's failed for four years I was like, then why is she still there? Why are you still taking 10 grand a year if she's failed yeah. level four for four years? That's what I have an issue with because then it's like, sweet, she's going to think Liverpool is shit because they've just 40 grand worth of debt, nothing from it. And and I think what you pointed out is like where uni is important, like subject matters like your, you guys. It's like, I think it's fundamentally that what you guys are doing is great, but it's to fix a problem two steps that like previously if that makes yeah, sense it yeah, totally yeah. needs to be in faculty if we could get exactly. enterprise and entrepreneurship in faculty from the beginning that that's what we need that would help everybody mm -hmm. because you know we could say oh well let's nobody go to uni but then who's going to come to liverpool how are we going to get the talent from outside of the city as well you know as dan davies at rock point says you know when he was building Rock Point, people were saying, why aren't you getting just local artists to do the paintings? And he says, well, Glast name. Glastonbury wouldn't be built. Yeah. No, th there is tons yeah. of great local artists. I'm not, oh, yeah, I'm not going to deny that. But yeah. you, like if, if somebody said that when Glastonbury was being started, then it wouldn't be Glastonbury, would it? It'd just be local. It, it'd just be too inward. So we need to ensure that we're retaining talent from outside the city and sort of importing it in as well and exporting some of ours so it, it's just a healthy you know What's a system healthy ecosystem yeah, yeah. Quite yeah. Diverse, I'm just going to interject it, just to give some space thank you and eventually it, just going to mention micro credentialing uh, i know Alison, you've done huge amounts of work and i learned a lot from you on that subject because they some of the things that you were mentioning in your list were looked like there were micro credentials and it's a question around how um, universities build micro credentialing into what they offer um, but before we get into that I just wanted to check um, Johnny Clark had your hand up do, do you want to come in Johnny I know you're on the call it'd be good to get your view on this I think you've I don't, I don't want to, I just want to make sure we're does anybody want to any ask any questions at this point or comment I know we've got about 15 minutes left so I want to just create some space for the floor to come in yeah I was I mean I, I put my some of my thoughts into the chat um fantastic discussion by the way though very insightful Thanks, uh, on, yeah. on all parts of the panel but I mean just to kind of summarize some of my points so you know for, for reference I'm um I'm an entrepreneur um board advisor angel investor um and a consultant to national and local government, political parties, and everything in between. Um, and I used to run a university program, so you could say I'm chronically indecisive about what exactly it is I want to do with my life. But the, I think, again, I, I'm kind of paraphrasing what I've already put in the chat to some degree. Um, in smaller ecosystems, such as Liverpool, um, Sheffield, uh, Newcastle, um, some other towns around the UK, the public sector and in particularly the universities have an increased role to play because they are disproportionately dominant in the local economy. Um, and that's also kind of exacerbated because of a lower number of private sector enterprises. Um, I, I think it's a national problem that, that kind of has acute sort of manifestation in local areas. Um, so I've mentioned in, in, in the messages in the chat about problems to do with technology transfer offices and spin outs and the you know how kind of underweight certain areas are but how underweight the UK as a whole is compared to other countries um, in regard to spinning out but then supporting and ensuring survivability of, um, of, of ideas that have come from the academic base 
a lot of universities are quite frankly predatory with with the terms that they provide and a number of individual businesses that i've advised are basically uninvestable because of terms that they've taken in good faith um because you know phd students people with no entrepreneurial experience or early stage academics don't know better and um, so you know they trust the terms that they're given and next thing they've lost 35 percent of the business for practically nothing in return and certainly no amount of money uh, and, and no staff i think moving away from spin outs and thinking more generally about um ab about the role of universities in general in local economic development and particularly with regards to the creative industries i you know i think things like founders are a step in the right direction um i think you know, I, I, the, the general feeling that I've got is that up, up to the point of managers and directors, it's actually quite positive in terms of the engagements that you can have with, with most, not all universities, but with most. But once it seems to get to the kind of senior executive level, I think that's where the kind of competing demands, which again, I mentioned in the chat, that's where they come in because yeah, there is CAF now, there is impact and there's other frameworks, but early, early career academics who are, you know, great, there are they're, they're a postdoc, they're competing against a thousand other people for the next position in the chain. Ref and TEF are still king, and particularly Ref if you want to go to a research intensive institution. So I think that's a major stumble and block in, in that. I, I, I think broadly though, universities are probably 25 to 33% of the debate about how you actually catalyze greater cluster development in the creative industries. But I'll, I'll stop there because that's definitely more than I needed to say. Thank you though <laughs> for having good. me on. Cheers, Andrew. Great, great input, Johnny. Thank you. And uh, yeah, it, it left us with an intriguing comment there at the end of sort of trading off with that. Uh, it'd be great to um, for you to come back into the debate. I, so the, if we can come back to this question, so given the fact that universities are only part of the answer, I mean, let's look at perhaps this question and, and again, welcome inputs from the from the floor here around what what Liverpool has to do to get into the top 10. Because you may, three of you have mentioned uh, some really good points there around what may be limiting, um, for example, the, you know, the, the presence of local government and um, connections with the university and so on. What, what are the big one, two or three strokes that Liverpool has to do to, to kind of get to the point where it's top 10, not out of the top 20? Uh, Catherine, you've got to, I'm just going to respond to Catherine, who's got a hand up there. Love to hear from yes. Catherine. Yeah. Uh, Hello, David. Uh, Alison and Andy, Andrew and I have already said hello. Um, I just wondered, particularly Alison, but it may be relevant for David, whether you've actually got connections with uh, the Grosvenor Company, owned by the Duke of Westminster, of course, uh, which might make it topical or controversial. But actually, Grosvenor are a very hard-nosed development company. They've put a billion pounds into Liverpool and to set up Liverpool One, which I know is a huge shopping development. But actually, on top of that, they have uh, consistently been interested in innovation and in startups. And I think their commitment to Liverpool, and obviously they live in Chester and Cheshire, um, is really fundamental to who they are. And they would have a very deep uh, interest in what goes on there, particularly because of the close connections. And I just wonder if you haven't, whether that might be another source of um, income which you would qualify for, so you wouldn't have to compete with it quite so um, viciously as we usually have to compete for our funding, um, because they're already there and they are set up to help that environment and that community, and particularly the geographical area. Yeah, um, one of my friends actually lives in one of the houses that they own in Chester, so that was interesting. But um, yeah. so yeah, they, I mean. They do quite a bit for the community up in Chester anyway. Yeah. But no, I've not actually tapped into it. Uh, I yet. think the Grosvenor Company, you know, would be the commercial side because yeah. that would be, um, they wouldn't be uh, any easier perhaps than many others, but they are fundamentally interested in the areas that you're working on, I think. That's something, yeah, I'll definitely take that on board and look into. Right. It would be good to set up something, you know, independence as we say like entrepreneur led so if they could do something that would be external so it's you know so nobody is the the key holder of it all mm -hmm. in a way it's sort of got to be led by the a group of people not just yeah. you know Agreed. Yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting point, Alison. I'll just come in there, uh Catherine, because so what you're highlighting, Catherine, I think is this um 
this this uh, perhaps it's, it is a debate between the, the, the vertical and the horizontal because Liverpool One is archetypally the the big set piece development that many think that Liverpool should embrace the, the mm -hmm. big uh, grade A high commercial developer development which of course has worked well in Manchester so mm -hmm. the review that I mentioned is led by Norm Bernstein and there's no doubt that that's the I mean there are and there are examples in Liverpool that have clearly been successful. The question really is, should there be much more of that? Should we become a grade A city like Manchester? Or as I think as you're alluding to, Alison, should it be much more locally owned, um, evolving, emergent, messy, yeah, um, experimental as you were pointing to, Dave, with people trying and failing and experimenting with with emergent technologies? Um, but so and there are there are sort of different but and clearly that's going to take longer um, so that there's some um, but the, the nature of the character of the city um, is 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 at stake here I think so I just want to throw that back to um, Dave and, and Alison just to just kind of think about you know vertical versus horizontal city which is I think behind Catherine's question if I may say I don't know if that's that's a fair summary Catherine Dave, do you want me to, or do you want to? I'm just uh, afraid of taking over. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, uh, I think um, like the whole vertical and horizontal. We need both. Like I think, yeah, Liverpool very labour, but we need the Tories. Tories very commercial. Like we need we need everyone. We just need everyone just to kind of work together. And as I put in the chat, I feel like this whole talk, I've just been like a bit of moan and person like there are boss things happening same with Grover so we heard about them through Dan Davies who we've been chatting with in uh, mm. New Brighton I think one thing to maybe highlight with New Brighton is you know Dan Davies goes up against the council and now the council see oh he's doing some good stuff let him do it sweet and I think we just need more people just to say say sorry afterwards and just go and do it and that's what we're trying to do is you know just get on chat say that we need some bigger like maybe not investments of money, but investments of exposure. Because on the Wivel, we have a VR company. There's a VR company down the road. We did a, um, a little show last year in our old building, and there's like 50 tech companies came, and they're all Birkenhead based. So when I was saying like no one talks, that might be a Wivel thing, but like I think everyone's scrapping for a bit of like too much work or trying to get money in that we don't have time to market, if that makes sense, because there's not enough outward investment coming in. And it's like, yeah, kind of brain drain from the university. So again, please don't feel like I'm bitter about everything because I'm liking these conversations. It's kind of, it's it's motivating me to be uh, a little bit more smiley. So, <laughs> sorry. Well, I think what you're yeah. saying though, it's not, it's not, there's not, a, there's not a dichotomy. It's obviously going to be the right mix somehow. But I think finding that balance between, you know, the the grade A and the and the, the, the locally owned emergent is is difficult. Alison, what's your view on that? Totally agree. Like, if we want to grow, we can't stay just loads of SMEs all the time you know they an SME needs to grow they need to be able to have the people to invest and help them grow and and yeah. build that company into a larger enterprise however you know look at Liverpool one how many shops are empty in there they should be they should be filled you know the footfall that that gets why is not full of like vibrant new things like they they pulled down a good alternative place called Quiggins which has so many companies in one building to then put in a bra shop which which then closed down. Um, so mm -hmm. to me, it's it's a loss of heritage awesome. culture. Um, well, and it, Alison, sorry, I, I I totally agree with that. It's Catherine uh, yeah. speaking. I um, think that could also be an opportunity. I'm involved with a, a trust in um, Leeds, actually. Uh, we, well, it's a national trust, but uh, not the national trust. It's uh, to do with mathematics, but. Um, uh, Leeds Shopping Centre, the owners gave us, have given us uh, space for no rental for two years. And I just wonder, that's the sort of thing that perhaps a conversation from you to the Grosvenor Estate, um, they would be really happy because it brings people in and it creates a buzz and it means that it gets known and it doesn't cost them very much because it's... That is something that's in the plans. We've tried, like when I was a student and I was getting into starting businesses because I had creative things going on, we did try in a smaller shopping centre, but it was when the shopping centre was on the downturn. So it was just up the road from Liverpool, one called Clayton Square, and there was no footfall at all. So even putting our businesses in there, you know, unless you're 
a brand name that people were going in for it wasn't going to support independent businesses whereas I think mm-hmm. if we did do that with Liverpool one it would be great um, mm-hmm. I think having, well, I having think a mix as, as you pointed out you're no longer students and actually the world has changed and they just have got the space anyway so for people who need some startup space as a, a bit of low rental very you know sort of easy to use they might be open to that for a while which could be a help for some of your startup businesses that's all yeah I think even buildings like the old Debenhams building imagine if that was a really big tech hub you know it takes up so much space it's right in the center of town you can travel there and it's also great exposure for any companies that could be in there and um, mm-hmm. they need to start reusing all that space in completely different ways I think yeah yeah, yeah. There's, uh, one of the things you're highlighting, Catherine, I think, is also the need for long-term patient capital. I think, Johnny, you were perhaps alluding to that as well. Because one of the things about having a political city is it does get does interfere with the stop-go um, nature of funding, particularly around some of the, the more um, adventurous art projects, um, which inevitably create uncertainty. So, so having long-term funding is important. Uh, Dave, is that Dave? You got your hand up there. So. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, sorry, I don't, don't want to disturb. But like, yeah, just to put on that note of yeah, I think maybe give a bit of a background. Have we got enough time? Like thirty um, seconds. Just or... got two minutes. So just, just, just a quick short oh. comment, David. Yeah, then... basically, start yard. Uh, yeah, took over a building here, put loads of pods in, and when you're saying about you know cheap rent, it yeah. works. So people are moving from Baltic Triangle, where it's fifteen hundred quid over here, five hundred quid. Yeah. That just allows them to hire someone else on minimum wage. Like, but if that's the idea, Great there's job. lots of empty buildings on the river around Liverpool. Just yeah. give the space away. And I think, yeah, well, part of the problem with like Start Yard is they had terrible issues with the council. And like we've tried to get with them because like it's like, oh, you had a little coffee shop here. It's gonna take away from Birkenhead. Birkenhead, like no one's gonna come here from Birkenhead. <laughs> so how is it going to take away and then it's like yeah. yeah but now it's got a thriving environment all pods andrew's here like yeah it's like it's working and we're all working together and it's like we just need more spaces like that and yeah, yeah eventually it might gentrify and more parking and yeah. more parking more infrastructure that's what start yards got I've been parking, right yeah. there. I, I, it's, it's terrible to do this because i know we should carry on but i just wanted to hand back to, to helen and just um to you know, thank you both for for um, uh, teeing up for this and getting engaged so much. Uh, thanks for your comments, Catherine and Johnny. And um, I know all of you'll be um, tasked to summarise all this into a blog somehow. I don't know how you will, but um, we'll try uh, try and help you with that. Um, Helen, do you want to come back in and and um, say anything more before we finish? I know it's two o'clock now. So. Yeah, uh, th- th- thank you, Andrew, for sharing it so brilliant. Th- thank you, Alison. Thank you for Dave. It, it, it's fascinating. I, I am a, a bit depressed by it all, though, because as Andrew pointed out at the beginning, there's a lot to do and you're doing absolutely amazing things, but it's just the future just looks so uncertain. I'm going to look at that report that was put in the blog by Jonathan. So I wish you all the best of luck because it's an amazing city and the opportunities for creativity there are fantastic. So it would just be nice to think there was a magic wand and it was all going to get better. But um, yeah, best best of luck. But thank you for this fantastic debate and thank you for the comments from the audience. So yeah, great. Well done. Thank you. Thank you very much.